Good afternoon, everyone. Um, happy Friday. My name is David Hu uh, from the University of Washington um, School of Social Work. So for uh, the third portion of this symposium, um, I'll be walking all of you through um, a, a case example of a one-step meta-analysis using individual level or observation level data. So one of the points that I want to make from the outset is that our talk is very focused on alcohol data. Um, a lot of the lessons that we've learned in our research group will generally apply to a lot of the types of data you'll encounter in prevention research in terms of the types of data, in terms of the types of statistical anomaly questions that may uh, come up. So the approach that I will be describing for you is that one that accommodates a lot of those features that you'll often see in trial data. So those would include skewed outcomes with lots of zeros. Um, it's very common for when you're looking across of intervention studies that some of them, most of them will be two-arm, but many of them will have multiple treatments that are being evaluated in the same study. So that'll be something, a point that'll be discussed. And also, um, by design, RCTs are generally longitudinal studies where people are assessed at a baseline and one or more follow-up assessments. So longitudinal data is another aspect of RCTs and also the type of um, consideration when you're combining across studies. So from the outset, um, my colleagues have mentioned multiple points about um, sort of the reasons why we would want to embark on analysis uh, using IPD. So in particular, the advantage of a one-step analysis using observational level data is that it gives us this very nice springboard from the outset to give, um, to look at other research questions. So say your first analysis is looking at those overall treatment effects across alcohol intervention studies, which is the case of our analysis. But then once you have that done, presented, then you also have the option of extending that analysis to look at subgroup effects. Um, there's an increasing emphasis in behavioral science research these days also on uh, mechanisms of intervention effects. When you have that individual level data and you model it in your statistical model, it gives you a wealth of options later on for how to look at follow-up questions. In addition, a lot of statistical issues can be addressed in that one-step analysis, like being able to account for individual level factors um, of your participants across different studies. Um, and also accounting for the particular nuances of um, data. In particular, alcohol data has some uh, challenging characteristics, which I will touch upon in a little bit. So the general overview of this talk is, um, is more conceptual, like my colleague, uh, Dr. Moon. Um, so it's really about walking through a case example and sort of thinking about the different issues that will arise in this particular example with alcohol data um, and then when you're embarking on your own meta-analysis, if you do have access to individual level data, or you potentially could, what are the types of um, challenges or considerations that may come up? So those include, in the context of drinking, modeling um, a number of drinks with a huge stack of zeros, on that issue of combining data from studies with different numbers of treatment arms, and then later on in the talk, I'll get into the specific modeling issues in terms of how we would actually estimate a one-step IPD meta-analysis. So the illustrative data for this example comes from uh, Project Integrate 1.0. So this was a meta-analysis project of two dozen studies that evaluated brief motivational interventions for college drinking. So the example IPD for this particular example uh, draws from over 13,500 uh, 13, assessments from nearly 6,000 individually spread across 15 different studies. So the focus of this particular group of randomized trials was sort of a combination of a brief motivational approaches. So uh, either um, individual motivational interview with personalized feedback, the prototypical example of that would be basics. Um, a standalone personalized feedback intervention where participants either, uh, are given some type of uh, normative feedback about their own drinking levels, and then group format type of MI interventions. So the outcome being used in this example is uh, the average number of drinks on a typical drinking day uh, assessed using the daily drinking questionnaire, which is a pretty standard um, instrument used to measure drinking in the field. So the data across these uh, 15 studies uh, include generally a baseline assessment, or on all cases they do, and anywhere from one to three follow-up assessments up to a year after randomization. 
So this is what the drinking data looks like. So each of these panels is the frequency distribution for um, average number of drinks in each of those studies. So it's very likely if you're conducting your own research or looking at data from someone else's study that your drinking data or substance use data will look like one of these potential panels. So generally, a huge stack of zeros on the left side. In a couple of cases, depending on the recruitment criteria of your study, it may be a drinking only sample, but generally you're gonna be encountering a lot of zeros. In some cases, up to half of your data might be zero. So what do we do about this? Um, well, first off, you know, the general tendency in the field up to this point has been you know, classic meta-analysis methods that are just taking a simple average. Um, but you know, if we dig a little bit further, um, we, we see that first, behavioral outcomes in prevention science research often have this type of feature, lots of zeros. And this will come up in alcohol data. Um, where I've seen this also is in suicide-related research. Um, sexual risk behaviors, any type of behavioral outcome, it's very common to encounter a lot of zeros. And those zeros, rather than sort of being treated as sort of a nuisance feature of the data, they may potentially have some meaning. So the zeros are a key feature um, that um, we could potentially um, look at. So in the context of treatment research, uh, intervention, we can think of those zeros versus non-zeros as an intervention having either an effect on whether someone drinks or not, so the zero being not, no drinking, and then one or more being the decision to drink, and then the number of drinks, if they're non-zero, when they are drinking. So there are different approaches for modeling this type of zero alter data, and some of these have been discussed in other symposia. Um, one of those approaches is what's known as a hurdle model, which is a type of two-part model where you're essentially breaking up your data into two pieces. So one piece is what I just alluded to before, which is the zero or one, zero being a zero, no drinking, and one being uh, any level of drinking above, equal to or above one drinks. And then um, the number of drinks is the second part, uh, the subsample of positive drinks, the level of that. So the, the idea and the naming of the hurdle is definitely not an accident. It actually goes to this metaphor or analogy of you're crossing this hurdle in, from not drinking into the decision to drink. And then once you've made that decision, uh, how much are you drinking? So the first part of that, zero or one, that can be modeled in a logistic regression model. And then the, the amount of drinking, uh, when drinking, that can be modeled in a count model. In this case, the specific of it is a zero truncated count model since it excludes zero. <clears throat> so another decision point that comes up when embarking on meta-analysis, and this applies to aggregate data meta-analysis as well, is this, uh, the situation where you have both two-arm studies and multi-arm studies. So more than three-quarters of studies generally are two-arm studies. Uh, in Project Integrate, uh, about one in five evaluated uh, multiple treatments, so two or more. So the situation is actually relatively common. So this has kind of been a recurrent issue of how to deal with this in the literature. So because of sort of the, the way that the data is structured, um, a multi-level model seems like a logical choice. So you have the observation level data, um, so each participant may have multiple uh, assessments, and then those participants are assessed or um, recruited within a particular study. Um, so this kind of lends itself to this multi-level type of thinking. Um, so one sort of natural way of modeling this would be to think of studies as the uppermost level of the model, participants nested within those individual studies, and then potentially multiple assessments per participant. So we could look at then treatment as a predictor of treatment effect within kind of this multi-level modeling framework. So um, what this might look at, so combining that first aspect of a zero altered count outcome, so and then breaking up that outcome into zero or, uh, or greater than zero, and then the amount if it's greater than zero, um, we can do a multi-level model uh, in, uh, in a hurdle model regression. So what that might look like is a hurdle model where you're looking at 
um, on uh, this equation, the third line, it's looking at the average treatment effect. So those are, you can think of those as dummy variables or, or uh, fixed effect predictors of the treatment effect. Uh, so in the case of this set of 15 studies, because we have multiple types of treatments, uh, in comparison with control, we're looking at three dummy variables. So, so the basics types, interventions versus control, personalized feedback only, that's the PF beta four versus control, and then the GMI versus control as well. So up to this point, this could be just like a single study regression model looking at data from just one randomized trial. Where it gets into the multi-level part is uh, from uh, the third line down. So that U sub zero S is modeling a study specific intercept. So essentially modeling the mean, the covariate adjusted mean level of drinking or not drinking within each of those individual studies. And then within a multi-level framework, if you're looking at a predictor, um, you can also see whether it varies by your grouping variables. So those U sub 1s's are random slopes or varying slope coefficients for each of those treatment contrasts. So in a sense, this model is estimating a study specific, if a study, for example, evaluates some version of motivational interviewing with personalized feedback, we would get a treatment effect for, say, study two, if they looked at that. And then the final R sub zero IS at the last is accounting for that clustering due to individuals. So data within individuals being more common than data from different individuals. So there's a hitch. The hitch is that the previous model is uh, in statistical parlance ranked efficient. Uh, since not all treatment effects or treatment types were evaluated on all of the studies. So in this collection of 15 studies, we have three potential treatments. Motivational interviewing with personalized feedback, personalized feedback only, and the group format MI. So across all of these studies, um, over half of those combinations were not evaluated. Um, so using kind of that particular statistical model I just described, you would not be able to calculate a random slope of treatment for a study that did not evaluate a particular treatment in that set of three possible treatments. So at this point then we need to start thinking about how do we deal with this methodologically and there are some different options. So uh, probably the simplest would be uh, basically to massage your intervention coding, which would be to combine, uh, for example, if a study looked at two or, two or more different treatments, just to code them as one group. Um, likewise, you could also just decide to keep one of those multiple groups and just compare that one group against treatment. So the, the issue there is that we're losing information, so it's not ideal. Uh, another possibility is Multi-level models can be done, for instance, in a structural equation modeling framework. So you know, for studies that did not evaluate a particular combination of treatment uh, or a particular type of treatment, we could constrain that treatment effect to some value in order to estimate the rest of the model. Um, so that may not be ideal uh, either because we're making some strong assumptions there. So the approach that we decided to go with was to exclude those non-existent study by treatment combinations that were making this model ranked efficient in a way that we couldn't estimate a result. So what this equates with is defining the individual randomized group at the highest level of a multi-level model. So the way that I like to think of this is using the analogy of an ANOVA. So oftentimes in uh, your first year stats class, you will sort of cover one-way ANOVAs and two-way ANOVAs. So one of the things that's very interesting about ANOVAs is if you have a factorial ANOVA, say a two-by-two two design, that is equivalent to a one-way ANOVA where you break out all of those combinations into four different groups. So in a sense, the way, one way of dealing with that ranked efficiency in the context of lots of studies with a few different treatment types is to basically use that in order to reparameterize your multi-level model to exclude those groups. So what that looks like is um, what I just described. So the difference with this particular type of model is that you would exclude that fixed effect for treatment. So this is the equation for the, the, the first part of that hurdle model looking at the probability of any drinking versus no drinking. So um, the, the outcome itself is the, just the probability. And then um, from there we get into the covariates. Here drinking at baseline is controlled for, that's that beta one. Um, 
and that makes it into kind of like an analysis of covariance model longitudinally. And then you can control for one or more or none or zero covariates. And then the key part of this model is that U sub zero G. So what that in effect is doing is you are calculating a covariate adjusted mean probability of drinking for each of those individual a randomized group across all of your studies. So uh, recall that there are a group of 15 studies. Each of those have a control condition, and each of those have potentially multiple treatment conditions. So in our particular study, we had, I believe it was 34 total randomized groups. So that's both control conditions and randomized uh, treatment conditions. The negative binomial portion of the model is essentially the same, except instead of modeling the probability of any drinking, you look at that subset of data, which is when people are drinking one or more drinks. So how do we do this? How do we estimate this type of uh, regression model of zero altered count data? So one of the features of this particular analysis, if you are trying to estimate your means as a varying intercept coefficient, is that you actually need the, the group-specific intercepts for all of your groups. So for those of you that have you know, looked at uh, multi-level modeling or HLM output, generally the type of output you get is you would get a standard deviation for your random effects. So you would get a summary statistics, and then you would get a, a potentially a point estimate for the mean uh, deviation of each of those individual groups, but you would just get one number or two numbers potentially. So in order to do this, you would actually need the full distribution of all of those groups. So the, the natural way to do this would be through a Bayesian uh, framework. So a Bayesian approach to mo uh, multi-level modeling, uh, typically done with Markov chain Monte Carlo methods, essentially what you're doing is you're simulating each of those regression parameters, including those group-specific uh, adjusted means of drinking, and then getting an entire distribution. So instead of point estimates, you're actually, in effect, getting a data set. So each of those columns in your data set would be simulated values of your, say, your uh, regression coefficient for, for example, if you're looking at your fixed effects for baseline drinking, but then into the meat of the model, what we can use then to calculate treatment effects, it gives us this data that we can use to calculate treatment effects. So what this model is doing, it's essentially giving us a distribution and it's um, uh, uncertainty for drinking. So this is just looking at one part of the model. The salmon colored curves are for intervention conditions. So that's the deviation for each of those intervention groups from the average across all of the studies. And those blue uh, curves are the distributions for the control conditions. So at this point, uh, it becomes an algebra problem. So it's matching up those salmon-colored curves with those blue curves taking the difference. So it's basically a little bit of accounting and doing the subtraction in order to calculate the difference between each of the active treatments versus the controls. So uh, the example here is done for one of the particular studies. You take your data set of simulated values from your Markov chain Monte Carlo estimation uh, in the leftmost column, and then you subtract from that the corresponding simulated value from your control condition, and that difference then gives you a treatment effect size for a particular treatment done in a particular study. So ultimately, whether it's an aggregate level data meta-analysis or an IPD, the end result is something that looks like this, a forest plot that shows you the average treatment effects for each of the studies, and then at the very bottom, an aggregate data, an overall metric of across all of your different studies and all the treatments they assessed, um, how effective does it seem these treatments are doing? So in that particular study, so this particular example comes from an article that will be published uh, in the July issue of Addictive Behaviors. An earlier version of this same meta-analysis was published in 2014 in uh, the journal ACER, Alcoholism, Clinical and Experimental Research. So um, the general um, sort of 
finding, if we go back to this meta, this meta analysis plot, uh, this forest plot, is that you know, alcohol interventions seem to be you know, generally in the right direction. They're, they're resulting in improvements to um, reducing the likelihood of drinking, but those effects are generally pretty small. In this case, for this particular outcome, overall it's non-significant. In the previous paper I mentioned that was published in 2014, for the negative consequences we were finding for sort of the MI plus personalized feedback interventions, there was a small and statistically significant treatment effect. So taken all together, um, this approach represents a feasible way of combining data from heterogeneous studies so that heterogeneity can come in the form of different treatment arms. It can come in the form of different distributions of the data, some with more zeros, some with less, differing numbers of assessment points, while accounting for the fact of you know, the, the nested nature. One of the minor drawbacks of the approach is something that's typical of many Bayesian analysis, which is because it's a simulation approach, it can potentially take some time to run. So in the case of this particular example, the estimation was uh, about two hours. So kind of an extended lunch break. Uh, so future directions. So potentially looking at um, applying the same thinking into different types of outcome distributions. One of the active areas of work of Project Integrate 2.0 is looking at the combination, as my colleague Dr. Moon uh, discussed, um, of both individual level data and aggregate data in that same model. So one of the challenges of IPD is while on one hand it's very powerful, on the other hand you can't always get the widest net of studies when, you know, for example, people won't be sharing their data. So by combining all those sources we could potentially increase our statistical power to look at some of these questions. So there is a tutorial walkthrough that I just mentioned that it will be published in the 2019 uh, July issue of Addictive Behaviors. And what I described, there is annotated code in R um, and example data, the same data that was used to generate that forest plot um, that was in a couple slides before. Um, all of that is available online on the Mendeley Data repository. So thank you so much. And